Sri Ramakrishna incarnated into a physical body form in India in the 19th century. He was seeking God with desperate thirst. While working as a head priest in the Kali temple located in the rural town of Dakshineswar, he finally attained God realization when his burning desire for God marked the climax. He attained through various other religions and all sects, which existed in Hindu religion, and said to himself, All religions are one. Soon after that, his destined disciples started to gather together at Sri Ramakrishna. Sri Ramakrishna loved his disciples dearly and wished for their spiritual growth from the bottom of his heart. Many of those who witnessed Sri Ramakrishna's unconditional love with their own eyes became fascinated with him and soon found their own path towards God. Today, we would like to introduce you to those fascinating stories of the bond of love between Sri Ramakrishna and his disciples. Swami Arabhatananda Arabhatananda, popularly known as Latu, was from a poor family of a remote village that has had no formal education whatsoever. Later on, however, he attained the highest wisdom through the Master's touch. Swami Vivekananda once said, Latu is Sri Ramakrishna's greatest miracle. He served Sri Ramakrishna as his personal servant since he was young. Due to a lack of formal education, Latu was unsophisticated and obeyed Sri Ramakrishna's words with single-minded devotion. It was his habit to see the Master first in the morning and to bow down to him. In the morning, when he opened his eyes, if the Master was not there for some reason, Latu had started to call him aloud and uttered the words, Where are you, sir? He kept his eyes covered with his palms until his master came back to the room. One day, Sri Ramakrishna questioned Latu. Do you know who is within my body? Latu replied, I don't know. Sri Ramakrishna said, The Lord is within it. Dear Latu, don't forget him. Never ever forget him. With his hands folded, Latu said tremulously, How can I forget someone who loves me so dearly? Indeed, Latu never forget him for the rest of his days alive. His heart was filled with willing love for Sri Ramakrishna, and he carried out the Master's instructions implicitly throughout his life. In 1885, Sri Ramakrishna suffered from fatal throat cancer, and he was removed to a garden house at Kaspo for his treatment. Young devotees came over to the house and took care of Sri Ramakrishna day and night, and Latu, of course, was one of them. Sri Ramakrishna's body gradually became weaker and more emaciated. When it became impossible for the master to walk as far as the bathroom, Latu, seeing his anxiety, said with great earnestness, Sir, here I am, you are sweeper. I will take care of everything for you. Ever since, Sri Ramakrishna passed away on August 16, 1886. Latu lived as Sri Ramakrishna's servant as he had promised. He never spent a single day without thinking of him nor feeling grateful for him. And of course never broke his vow. He held on to the same principle for the rest of his life for the sake of following his master's teaching. He used to often quote from Vivekananda saying, if I can not get Rama, shall I live with Shama? If necessary, let this life be spent in devotion for Sri Ramakrishna. Swami Brahmananda
Vivekananda and Brahmananda, previously known as Rakao, were the two finest among the direct disciples of Sri Ramakrishna. Sri Ramakrishna once prayed to the Divine Mother, Mother, I want Saman to be my constant companion. A few days later, he saw in a mistake vision, the mother had placed a little boy on his lap and said, This is your son. After a while, Sri Ramakrishna saw another vision in which two boys are dancing on the beautiful lotus on the Ganges. One of them was Sri Krishna, and the other was the boy he had seen in his earlier vision. Sri Ramakrishna was completely overwhelmed with sacred vision, and he was lost in ecstasy. Just then the boat arrived at Dakshineshwar. Sri Ramakrishna looked at the boy on board in bewilderment. Why is this? Here is the boy, I see dancing on the lotus with the Sri Krishna. This boy was Rakal Brahmananda. Sri Ramakrishna talked to Rakal for some time, as though Rakal was an old friend of his. Then, in a safe voice, he said to Rakal, Come and see me again. Sri Ramakrishna's voice stayed within Rakal's heart and he became incapable of thinking about anything but Sri Ramakrishna. One day, he began living with the Master at the Kali Temple and devoted himself to a contemplative life and the service of his guru. Over time, the Master's careful guidance led Rakal to a supreme state of consciousness. After the Master's passing, he left for ascetic practice as a wandering monk in order that master his state of samadhi, formerly only possible by the grace of his master. Almost ten years later, he achieved what he had aimed for, and he devoted the rest of his life to his mission as president of the Ramakrishna mission. Sri Ramakrishna used to warn other disciples not to reveal Brahmananda's real nature to him as the playmate of Sri Krishna and one of the shepherd boys of Vrindavan, as doing so might cause him to give up his body if he became aware of it. One day in his late life, Brahmananda got together with Ramla, who also used to serve Sri Ramakrishna, and they took naturally turned to the early days. Meeting Brahmananda's request, Ramlal began to sing songs about Krishna and the other shepherds, which were the same songs they used to sing for Sri Ramakrishna. At first, they laughed low as Ramlal mimicked the gesture of the shepherdesses. Suddenly, Brahmananda, who had also been enjoying the fun, became serious when Ramlal sang, Come back, O oh Krishna, come back to Vrindavan. Come and reign in the hearts of your beloved shepherds and shepherdesses. Do not forget that you are a shepherd yourself. At that moment, Brahmananda seemed to have been transported to a realm beyond this earth. It's maybe that at that moment, Brahmananda might have gotten the partial glimpse of his true nature and knew himself to be God's eternal companion. A few weeks later, Brahmananda was sick in bed and deeply absorbed in meditation, and his face wore an expression of great fitness. Suddenly, out of the silence, the voice of Brahmananda was heard. Oh, that inexpressible light, Ramakrishna, the Krishna of my Ramakrishna. I am the shepherd boy, put anklets on my feet. I want to dance with my Krishna. Ah, Krishna, my Krishna, you have come. Krishna, Krishna, oh, how beautiful! My play is over now. Look, the child Krishna is caressing me. He is calling me to come away with him.
I am coming. Swami Vivekananda. Vivekananda, also called Narendra, was the foremost disciple with extraordinary discipline and exceptional intelligence. He was destined to be the heir of Sri Ramakrishna. As Narendra grew into adolescence, his deep spiritual yearning for God realization became so intense that it made him search around various sects of spiritual leaders that none of them could really satisfy him. One day, he had an opportunity to meet Sri Ramakrishna and sang a few melodious songs for him. When his singing was over, Sri Ramakrishna suddenly grasped Narendra's hand and said Narendra with tears streaming down his cheeks. Ah, you have come so late. How unkind of you to have kept me waiting so long. I know you are the ancient sage born of the earth to remove the miseries of mankind. The rationalist Narendra regarded these words as the meaningless jargon of an insane person. Naren asked the master, Sir, have you seen God? Without a moment's hesitation, the reply was given. Yes, I have seen God. I see him as I see you here quite clearly. Narendra was astounded. For the first time, he was face to face with a man who asserted that he had seen God. Since that time, he accepted Sri Ramakrishna as his guru and looked up to him. One day, Narendra was struck by a calamity. His father suddenly died leaving behind a hefty debt. After his father's death, his relatives brought a lawsuit against his family for the partition of the ancestral home. Narendra went out seeking a job to find the wherewithal to feed his family every day. Unfortunately, all his efforts to find employment failed. His financial distress wore him out completely. In despair, Narendra's heart became hardened. His harsh words and his attitude of indifference toward the God let negative rumors go round. When another devotee of the Master and an also intimate friend of Narendra cast aspersions on the latter's character, the master without doubt said, Stop, you fool. The mother has told me that it is simply not true. I shall not look at the face if you speak to me again that way. Some days later, Narendra had been out all day in the soaking rain searching for a job, having had neither food nor rest for the whole day. He was so exhausted that he fell unconscious on his way home. He was in a daze. All of a sudden, the veil was removed from Narendra by the power of God and all his anguish and doubts were cleared away. He was at peace and filled with power. At that moment, he became convinced that he was not born to lead a worldly life, but to renounce the world in order to realize God by proceeding to live a monastic life. Narendra was determined to renounce the world. Before his departure, he visited the master to ask his blessings on him. As they entered his room, Sri Ramakrishna went into an ecstatic mood and sang a song while tears bathed his eyes. We are afraid to speak and we are afraid to keep still. Our minds have believed that we are about to lose you. Narendra could not keep back his feeling any longer. So Narendra and the Master both shed many tears. The words of the song clearly indicated that the Master knew of the disciple's secret wish which he told no one. Then, choking up, Sri Ramakrishna begged Narendra not to renounce the world while he was alive. A few years later, Sri Ramakrishna developed throat cancer. Narendra, understanding the fatal nature of Sri Ramakrishna's illness, asked the master for the boon of remaining merged in Smadi three or four days at a stretch. Then Sri Ramakrishna scolded. Shame on you. You were asking for such an insignificant thing. I thought that you would be like a big banyan tree and the thousands of people would rest in your shade. But now I see that you are seeking your own liberation. Sri 
Sri Ramakrishna wanted the disciples to see God in all beings and to serve them in a spirit of worship. Vivekananda realized the greatness of Sri Ramakrishna's heart and shed profuse tears. He undertook a journey to America in order to carry out the Master's mission, and he successfully conveyed Sri Ramakrishna's message. All religions are aiming at the same goal, at the exposition of the Parliament of Religion. The success opened up his way to all over America, Europe, and India. He devoted his whole life to promoting yoga and serving people in absolute destitution. As a result of his wrestling activity, he completed his stormy life only at the mere age of 39. In the last chapter of his life, he began to express his love for the Master, which was hidden in order to complete his mission bestowed on Sri Ramakrishna. After all, I am only the boy who used to listen with rapt wonderment to the wonderful words of Sri Ramakrishna under the Ryan tree at Dakshineshwar. That is my true nature, and the rest are all superimpositions. Now I again hear his voice, the same old voice thrilling my soul. Not only the voice of the Master calling, I come, my beloved Lord, I come. Nag Mahashaya Though he started off as a homeopath, he lost his interest in medicine after a certain time and started to seek someone to show him the way to God instead. One day, he heard about Sri Ramakrishna through his friend, and he immediately left for Dakshineshwar. When he first met Sri Ramakrishna in his room, Nag Mahashaya fell prostrate before Sri Ramakrishna and wanted to take the dust from the master's feet. Sri Ramakrishna withdrew his legs and did not allow Nagamahashaya to touch them, even though he felt a pang of disappointment, thinking that he was not worthy enough to touch the feet of the holy saint. He was completely taken by Master's irresistible venerability, and he went almost mad from his burning desire to see God after that. At the later dates, when Nagamahashaya visited Sri Ramakrishna again, he said to Nagamahashaya, well, you are a medical man. Please examine my legs and see what is there. Nag Mahashaya touched his feet, examined them well, and said that he had found nothing there. Sri Ramakrishna asked him again to examine them more carefully. Now, Nag Mahashaya touched the master's feet with more enthusiasm, and he came to realize that this was Sri Ramakrishna's small act of charity toward him. The master did not allow him to touch his feet on his first visit. However, on this day, he gave the privilege of touching his foot to Nagamahashaya under the veil of examining his foot. Tears trickled down Nagamahashaya's cheeks as he became aware of it, and he placed those long desired feet on his head and heart. At that moment, Nagamahashaya was convinced that Sri Ramakrishna was God incarnate. Later, Nag Mahashaya asked his permission to renounce the world for him, but Sri Ramakrishna commanded him to remain as a layman so as to show the true ideal for all laymen. He saw all people as the master, so he served them with the utmost effort, and he also accepted all hardships gladly as mercy and grace bestowed by Sri Ramakrishna. In his closing years, in spite of severe pain from his illness, he always said, How gracious and kind God is! It is all the grace of the Lord, don't even for a moment be doubtful of the boundless mercy of God. On one occasion, Nag Mahashaya said, Ramakrishna has come. From that moment forward, he continuously remained in the state of deep samadhi. Right before he died, his devotee Chakravarti, being the other largely the name of Sri Ramakrishna, placed his picture before Nag Mahashaya's eyes and said, 
This is the picture of your master. In whose name you have renounced everything. He looked at it and then saluted with folded palms. Then he uttered in his feeble voice, Grace, grace, grace out of thy own boundless mercy. Giris Chandra Ghosh. Though he was one with extraordinarily idealistic glamour and also a well-known playwright in the Bengali region, his life was filled with many ups and downs due to his departed nature and love for heavy drinking. He could not understand the master's magnificence when he met him for the first time. Because of the master's splendorous enchantment, the more Giris saw the master, the more he became attracted to him. In spite of Gerush's arrogance in his character and atheism, eventually his heart and heart was softened in a communion with Sri Ramakrishna. One day, Gerush offered himself completely to him and said, What shall I do from now on? In reply, Sri Ramakrishna gave him various instructions for his spiritual discipline. However, Girish had no confidence in following any of those instructions and thus remained silent. As Girish did not reply to the instructions, Sri Ramakrishna said with a smile, You will say, I cannot do even that. Very well, then given the power of autonomy, from now on I will take full responsibility for you. You don't have to do anything. Girish felt relieved and accepted his proposal. To Girish, it meant nothing more than this. Well, I don't have to give up anything by means of personal efforts or bother with the spiritual practices, but the Master will remove the last vestige of worldliness from my mind through his power. It was now sufficient to have firm faith that whatever he might do, the Master would have saved him one way or another by his divine power, but he didn't realize that he had voluntarily put around his neck a noose of love a hundred times stronger than the bandage of rules which he thought was so unbearable. Shortly after this incident, Girish said in the presence of the Master, I will do it, in respect to a trifling matter. The master remonstrated, suddenly saying, What is that? Why do you thus say, I will do it? Suppose you can't do it. What then? You should say, I shall do it if God so wills. Girish felt, this is quite right. Realizing this, he gradually gave up such words and ideas, as I will do it, I will go, and so on. Thus days rolled on. And at last, the master passed away. Girish met with various calamities such as the death of his wife, his son and others. However, his mind began to assert every time. He is allowing these events to happen only because these are good for you. You have transferred your responsibility to him and he has accepted. He has given you no assurance regarding the path along which he will take you. Knowing that this path is easy for you, is leading you along it. You have no reason to say no or complain about it. Were of it in empty words that you gave him the power of autonomy or transferred your responsibility to him? As more time passed, the hidden meaning of giving the power of autonomy was better realized by Girish. He could no longer do anything on his own, but completely surrender to God's will, and that made him think of the Master all the time. In the later years of his life, Girish was suffering from a severe case of asthma. So one day, he was pondering about his death. What will happen to me when I die? Where am I going? Just then M came to see Girish at his house and started to talk about the master as usual. All of a sudden, something popped into Girish's head and he said to M, My brother, 
Could you kindly smash my head with your slipper? I am not joking, I'm dead serious. M asked him the reason with a smile, then Girish replied. You know, I'm worthy of being beaten as I'm still thinking about my own death despite having a master as a guardian. On another occasion, he said, Did I know that there's so much lay hidden in the simple giving of the power of Atani? I now know that I sometimes dead end to the spiritual practices like japa, austerities, and devotional exercises. But there is no end to the work of a person who has given the power of Atani. 4. He has to watch every step and every breath to know whether he does so depending on him and his power while on this wretched eye. I don't even have the liberty of breathing by myself. Girish never took sick leave as it's against the master's will, though he was suffering severely from asthma. He used to say to people who worried about his condition, This body is not mine, but the master's, so it will be kept as long as he wanted it to be kept. Girish took his last breath on the 18th of February in 1912. His last words were Oh my dear master, here you are. Please cleanse me for my worldly sins. Glory to Sri Ramakrishna. Here I come. Their love for Sri Ramakrishna made them come into the world. Thus, they ran back to Sri Ramakrishna when their mission was completed. Though the apostles with their shared mission were tightly bound to each other, they reincarnate together into the world over and over, nursing their vow of love towards Sri Ramakrishna. To bring the light of hope to the suffering in this dark age. Oh, 
소동이 오고대 시배 사례다 고코로 가으며 어디서 마르던키 아나타 오모이 나스다케 때나이 